It's a great pleasure to me to study with you, friends of the audiovisual congregation, a favorite parable, the parable of the ten virgins, which I think, and which I may say virtually the whole Puritan tradition thought, was a profound study in the difference between true and nominal or false Christianity. We're going to examine in some detail in this little series what's the difference between these five women who seemed to be Christian and the five women who really were that one group was accepted when the bridegroom returned and the other group was eternally rejected. I think it's the difference between essentially what was taking place on the inside of them, the relationship of the Holy Spirit to what they did outwardly. That's the reason we have called this little series How to, be, how to Know Whether You Have Been Born Again. I think as we work our way through this parable, you will see that the essential difference is not in outward behavior here, but in inward motivation. And that half of that group had seemed to be born again, and the other half really was born again. As I mentioned to you a moment ago, the Puritans certainly saw it this way. The greatest of the Puritans, Jonathan Edwards, preached no less than ten and even a little more sermons on this particular parable. They're buried now as manuscripts in Beinecke Rare Book Room at Yale University. They're scheduled to be published in the Yale University Press of all of Jonathan Edwards' works. I think it'll be a major event when all of his sermons are published. Six volumes of his writings have so far been published, but no sermons as yet, but all of them are to be published chronologically. And when they get to this particular set of sermons, I think you will find in print the fullest analysis of Christian experience that Jonathan Edwards ever wrote short of his most famous work of all, The Religious Affections. I think it's worth your prayer, incidentally, for the success of this endeavor in having these tremendous sermons published and this particular set especially. So we will be looking together in this little series at how to be born again, focusing on that truth through the tutelage of our Lord in this famous parable, which I shall now read to you the first 13 verses of the 25th chapter of Matthew. I will be reading from the New American Standard Bible, an excellent translation, though by no means the only excellent translation on the market today. We're very fortunate these days to have a number of very fine ones indeed, and invaluable commentaries as well, which I recommend you're consulting while we're studying this. But I'm reading now Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were foolish, and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil. For our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, saying, No, 
There will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, Thou who hath given us Thy dear Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we praise Thee that Thou hast given us by inspiration the record of these words which He spoke so searchingly, so powerfully. And we invoke the presence of the Spirit who motivated Christ and motivated the writers of this record that he may motivate us to embrace what we see and follow as we are directed, and especially to examine ourselves to see whether indeed we have oil in our lamps. And to thy name, O Lord, be the praise and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now this episode, of course, is a description of a marriage, but before we look at that and some of the local custom of the time, let me remind you of the broader context in which this familiar parable is located. Very commonly, you know, it's important to know where a passage is located as well as what it is saying. Now this passage is in what all expositors recognize as an eschatological context, that is, a context dealing with things to come, with the end time, the eschatological events that still await us. The chapter which preceded this one from which we have read is, of course, the famous 24th chapter of Matthew, the little book of Revelation. You remember that was our Lord's discourse in answer to His apostles' question about the fall of Jerusalem and His own second coming. Now this 25th chapter seems to follow right along in that context of things to come and especially His own climactic return. This parable which we have just read, the parable of the virgins, obviously, in terms of the bridegroom, has to do with an impending event of the bridegroom, obviously Jesus Christ, coming for His church. The parable which follows this about the talents is the story of a master who left certain talents in trust of his servants and who, when he comes again, requires them to give an account. And the very end of this 25th chapter of Matthew, the great description of the separation between the sheep and the goats is the fullest picture we have of the last judgment in the entire Word of God. Now what we have here in Matthew 25 has to do with the return of Christ and the judgment manifestly, and this parable has us, in the light of that tremendous event, examining our hearts. The parable of the master and the servants, I think, has us examining what we're doing with the gifts. Money, yes, but all of our gifts in the service of that master who is about to ask for an accounting. The last episode in the 25th chapter, the final judgment, where inasmuch as you 
did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me, and inasmuch as you did not do it to the least of these, you didn't do it to me, is a test not of our state of heart at the moment in a sense, and not of our personal stewardship so much as our love for others, especially the church of God. But you see, the 24th chapter of Matthew is a grand overall description of the return of Christ with the fall of Jerusalem in the foreground. Matthew 25 seems to be a broadening of that perspective, a more general judgment of us all, this parable focusing on our heart, the next parable on our stewardship, and the final parable on our love for others, especially the church of Jesus Christ. Now, with that overview and general location, let us notice the study of this little series, The Parable of the Virgins, a study in the hearts of the professed people of God, the way by which we distinguish between true conversion and a spurious and merely nominal one, the way we find out whether we have oil in our lamps and whether when Christ comes again we will be admitted to His presence or rejected from it. Now, it's told in the story of a very familiar episode of marriage, wedding ceremonies of old. These virgins are what we would call maids in waiting, as it were, in our day. And while most of our weddings take place in the daytime, in the tradition of that time, they were at night. And you can see what was happening here. Those who were uh, the bride's friends were waiting for the approach of the groom, and they were to escort him to the bride and to the ceremony. And while they were waiting, he's apparently slow getting there, and he wasn't there as quickly as they had anticipated, and they fell asleep and were aroused suddenly from their sleep by his imminent approach. Five of these women were ready for it. And they prepared their lamps and they led him to the bride and the ceremony while the others discovered to their embarrassment that they were not equipped for that sudden coming. And while they were, as it were, endeavoring to prepare themselves, the event passed from them irretrievably. There's just no question, is there, what this means. Sometimes parables are puzzling. Sometimes parables are given, as Jesus said, to obscure rather than to reveal. The people who are curious and not really interested. But Christ is here talking to people who are interested. He's talking to people who take Him seriously, the people who obviously think they are Christians, and He's telling them something very, very profoundly different about those who think they are Christians and those who really are Christians. And he tells it in the familiar context of a very common episode of a wedding ceremony in which a very unusual thing happened and a very tragic thing happened for that local wedding and, of course, was manifestly a picture of what's going to happen. When he comes again for all of us or as it happens individually when he comes for us one by one, my friends in the audience, you all realize, do you not, when you die, you go immediately into the presence of Jesus Christ. It's just as sudden because no one knows when His appointed time to die has, is going to come. It comes and it's always something of a surprise, but immediately afterwards, it's appointed unto man once to die, and then immediately the judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, the final judgment. Millions of people have already faced that. Some people sometimes ask me, well, what's the difference between that judgment and the public judgment? The day of judgment, which is described in the end of this chapter, the sheep and the goats, the day of judgment has everybody before the judgment seat of Christ. How can that be if the judgments of millions of persons have already taken place at their individual deaths. Well, you see, the public judgment, which incidentally is not a judgment in the ordinary sense of the word, usually when a judge tries a case, it's to find out what the situation is. When this judgment has occurred, 
is to reveal what the situation is. This judge doesn't have to be told. He doesn't have to listen to a prosecutor or a defender. He knows perfectly. This judgment is not to find out information. This is to declare information. This is when the judgment takes place, not when the preparations for it are laid out. But you see, that day of judgment, the final judgment, is when all those who have already been judged are summoned up either from hell, where they are sentenced as unbelievers, or from heaven, where they are brought as believers, together with those who were alive at the time of Christ's return and who are judged on that particular spot. The public judgment, in other words, follows, as it were, the private judgments that are going on for centuries and the private judgment which takes immediately, takes place immediately in those who are alive when Christ comes again, and the declaration of it before all of mankind, heaven and hell, is made solemnly and finally, and the final condition of both groups is established. You see, in this present state, those in hell are suffering the torments of the damned in the soul only, their bodies rotting or having rotted in the grave. And the saints in heaven are joying the presence of Jesus Christ. As Paul says, for me to die is gain. To live as Christ, to die is gain, because he has more and a perfect a joy of Christ, but it's in the soul only. And as he says about the saints, they desire, even in their bliss now in the divine presence, they desire to be complete. We are body-soul beings. Angels are mere spirits, and animals are mere bodies. But the definition of a human being is an embodied spirit and perfectly happy as the spirits of just men made perfect is in glory, they are not complete personalities until that body which is rotting or has rotted in the grave is perfected to match the perfection of their soul. And that's what happens at the day of judgment. Hideous bodies to match the hideous souls of the damned are united with their bodies, and in that final state they suffer the torments of the damned in body and soul forever. And the saints in glory have a body as radiant and beautiful as their soul is now made perfect to enjoy the presence of God forever in heaven. So this judgment that we're dealing with here, the parable of the virgins, is a judgment which may occur to every one of you out there individually, has occurred to millions already individually. But this judgment at the end of the chapter is when all of us are gathered over in its presence. But at that time, you see, no opportunity to do anything. The verdict is simply rendered. Now we can find out whether we're wise or foolish virgins. When that Christ comes again, if we discover then that we're foolish virgins, there's nothing we can do about it. But here the verdict condemned. Now, if we realize as we work our way through this parable of our Lord that we're foolish virgins, we can seek for that oil while it may be found. And those who have it now will be acknowledged then in that great day. Now, as we study this parable more closely, the thing I want to bring out to your attention at first, since it's clear that this is a distinction between those who are acknowledged by Christ at His return, or they are coming into His presence at death and then later at His return, and those who are not truly His, then we see that this is a context in which the church as a whole is being dealt with. And we are seeing what these virgins, who are ultimately separated eternally from one another, have in common at the present time, beginning, obviously, with a common association. I mean by that, these women profess the same thing. They are waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. They are anticipating accompanying him to this celestial wedding feast. These are what we would call, in common parlance today, church members. This parable is not meant for down-and-outers. 
Christ isn't talking to people who don't ever come to the church. This has no meaning for individuals who have never read the Bible and know nothing at all about the Christian religion. This, my friend, is talking to you and me. I have the confidence to say you as well as me for the simple reason I can't imagine anybody listening to a videotape on Scripture who doesn't have some interest in Scripture. And in all probability, some association with the church, many of you, probably the overwhelming majority of you, are as I am, a member of the Christian church. Some of you may be as I am, a minister in the church as well. But it's very unlikely that we have very many people listening today who would normally be spending the day out on the links or hunting or reading the paper or sleeping in or something like that who couldn't care less about the Sabbath day or the Lord's day or about things of religion and so on. I can pretty confidently assume, however invisible you are to me as I talk, that you are virgins in waiting, that you are people who are members of the church probably. Certainly in this parable, we are dealing with professed Christians. That's the first thing. That's obvious. As I say, that's not for people outside these walls. That's not for Muslims and Jews and Hindus and so on. They have their own religion. They have their own interests. This is talking about us who are professed Christians. We may be the real article or we may not be, but we superficially, nominally, belong to the same group. Now, I can safely assume that this parable was meant for you as well as for me. So that's the first thing. If I may start to put some of the things down that these virgins have in common here in this parable. Things in common. Shall I call it that? Things true and nominal Christians have in common. The first one, as I say, is right on the surface of the parable. There's just no mistaking it at all. First, they are church members. They make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. When the census taker comes, and he asks, what's your religion? They don't say Jewish. They don't say Hindu. They don't say none. They say Christian. We're Presbyterians. We're Baptists. We're Roman Catholics. We're Episcopalians. We're, if they want to know the denomination, but if they'll settle for the class, these people will say, all of them, we are Christians. And if they're asked what particular denomination they adhere to, now, you see what this is saying to us at the very outset, that members of the Christian church, at least professors of Christianity, but probably members of the Christian church, have foolish virgins as well as wise virgins. They have members who, when Christ comes again, are going to be acknowledged and members who are going to be repudiated. You people who are listening to me, as I say, I don't see you, and yet I do see you. I'm almost absolutely certain that I'm talking to wise and to foolish virgins. The foolish virgins will invariably think they're wise. The merely nominal Christians in the company of the church out there or in your Sunday worship. They'll always think they are what they say they are and what the census taker labels them as being, but Christ doesn't think so. He doesn't think so now, but he's going to make it patently clear then. See, this is talking, in other words, to you professed Christians, to you church members, Church membership in the profession of the Christian religion never saved anybody. 
A friend of mine has written a book with an awesome title. Its content is even more awesome. Damned through the church. Well, he actually means that there's so much false doctrine coming through the church these days that people could actually be damned through the church, believing what the church, preaching another gospel, which is not another gospel, actually teach. But certainly there's an even vastly number of persons who are damned in the church. And in spite of the church, in spite of faithful ministers of the Word who day in and week out preach the truth of God in its fullness, and nevertheless, they hear and don't hear. They say they believe and don't believe. They're a member of this denomination or the other. They may be officers in the denomination. They may be, as I am, ministers in the denomination. They may be teachers of the ministers of the denomination. They're foolish virgins. And when Christ comes again, He's going to say to them, I never knew you. Do you hear me, my friends? Jesus is saying through this parable that some of you who think you know Him are not known by Him. And if He doesn't know you, you don't know Him. In other words, you are in a very dangerous spot. Let me say this as our time's about to run out, just to impress the importance of this very first and very obvious matter. There is one place worse than hell, and there's one place better than heaven. Did you know that? There is one place in the universe worse than hell, and there is one place better than heaven. You know where that is? Right where you're sitting now, right where I'm standing. You know what I mean by that? If you have Christ in your heart, if you're a true member of the church, if you really believe the faith you profess, if you are a wise virgin, then you are treasuring up riches in heaven. And every day you live, you're going to pile up your everlasting fortune all the more. Persons who have already gone to heaven are enjoying it but they don't have the privilege you have of increasing it. But every moment that you give as much as a cup of cold water in Christ's name, it will have its reward. And the Lord Himself, some people are a little squeamish about rewards. The Lord Himself says, lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. It's your duty to get richer and richer and richer in a capital that will never depreciate whose value can never be inflated. You are better now than being in heaven, but there's a place worse than hell. My friends, if you are foolish virgins, if your profession is merely nominal, if you say you know the Lord when He doesn't know you, you are building a treasure too. Christ has said it through His apostle Paul, heaping up wrath against the day of wrath. All the torments of the damned is fixed in quantity for eternity. The only people who can actually increase their everlasting torture are you people out there. Every day you go on, you add wrath to wrath. And every moment you live, it would be better for you if you had died. It would be better for you if you had never been born, as Jesus says, is that about that person who causes his little ones to stumble, as you undoubtedly are doing now? Better for that man that a millstone were tied around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. It's worse than being in hell, my friend, for you to remain impenitent where you're sitting. Believe me now and do something about it, because if you fall over where you're sitting, as could well be, you know, as truly as I do, you're going to wake up saying, open to me. And the Lord is going to say, who are you? I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. 
into the hell of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So, my friends, as we look at this parable, the first thing we see is that the wise and foolish virgins are church members. And the thing we must ask ourselves is, which am 